Okay, now let's assume that P1 were to do a write of A. It looks at its cache and it says, yes, I do have a cache hit. I do have a copy of A and this is a valid copy of A. Okay, but I don't have the permissions to do a write because this block is in shared state. It's not in modified state. So before I can perform my write, I have to make sure that I have the only exclusive copy of A and everybody else has to invalidate their cache copy. Okay, so it places a request on the bus saying I'm trying to do an upgrade. Okay, so no one has to provide data to me because I already have a valid a copy of this data. All I'm trying to do is move my permissions from S to modified. So I don't need a response but I'm just notifying everybody else that I'm doing a write. And everyone else is snooping on the bus and they see this notification and so P3 says that oh yeah someone else is doing a write so I have to give up on my latest permissions and so I'm going to go from S to invalid and this allows P1 to have an exclusive copy of the block and then from that point on it can do whatever reads and writes that it wants to do. Okay, so every time I want to do a write, I have to make sure that I have the only exclusive copy of the block. Okay, so you know at this point let me also clarify again, you know, why this is a snooping based protocol. You know, it's it's because there is no centralized agent that is telling everyone what to do. Everyone is paying attention to the bus and then, you know, engaging in a self managing process, right? So everyone is looking at the bus and saying, Oh, you know, someone is uh, is doing a write, so I'm going to invalidate my own cache copy. Okay, and so everyone knows what they have to do, and you know this is being determined just by paying attention to the bus. Okay, and this is why you know this is what characterizes the snooping-based protocol. Okay, let me walk through a couple more examples, and you know this this will uh, clarify a few other things as well. So you know let's assume that uh, so let me just complete what I had done earlier. So S moves to modified once you place the upgrade notification on the bus okay, and everyone else is in uh, invalid state. So now let's assume that P4 wants to do a write of A. Okay, So it looks at its cache, it sees that it does not have a valid cache copy of A. So it now places a request on the bus saying I'm trying to do a write of A. Okay, And everyone sees it, P1 realizes that it has the only valid cache copy of A so it has to provide the data. Okay, And so it then places the value of A on the bus. This gets accepted by this cache. This copy gets placed in modified state because you're trying to do a write. And likewise A is going to move to invalid state so that it relinquishes all control of this block and P4 has the only valid cache copy. Okay? So you know there are two other things to, to, to be noted over here. Okay, so if P4 is going to do a write of A what, what is the point of sending the value of A from P1 to P4, right? Because it's going to get overwritten anyway. The reason is that, you know, A is a cache block. So it's a 64 byte block and it has several words in it. P4 maybe wants to make a modification to this word over here. Okay, but it still needs the other cache blocks, right? And, you know, there are cache blocks over here or there are cache words over here that may have been modified by P1. So P1 may have done a write into this location, it may have done a write into this location and P4 perhaps is trying to do a write into a given word in that cache block, right? So it's not as if P4 is overriding the writes that were performed by P1, okay? So when you make a request for a write, you have to receive the entire cache block because you're, we, are storing, um, we are storing data in the caches at the granularity of a cache block and so I need to bring the entire cache block in and that allows P4 to then you know read and write any word in that cache block. Okay, so that's the reason why you know P1 has to send the data over to P4 even if P4 is doing a write into that block. Okay? Now I'd also previously mentioned that when a block goes from modified to shared, I have to do a write back into main memory. In this case, the block is going from modified in P1 to modified in P4. Okay, so in this case, I really don't have to update main memory with the writes that were performed by P1. Okay, because those writes are going to still hang around in this block and they they will be stored in P4. Okay, but you know there's no reason for main memory to be up to date because main memory is now not responsible for providing a copy of A to any subsequent requester. Right, if someone else wanted a copy of A, they would get it from P4. Okay, so main memory need not be up to date at this moment in time. So you know at this point when when, when the block transitions from modified in P1 to modified in P4, there's no need to do a write back into main memory. Okay, so a write back into main memory only happens when a block moves from modified to shared. Okay, so 
we've kind of gone through all these uh, many examples. I'll also, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll formalize this a little bit more in a subsequent video. Okay, but I just want to make sure that I've gone through all these points, and I think I have. Well, so you know, here's one point about tags. Okay, so you'll now see that there is a much higher pressure on the cache tags. Okay, because you know uh, the cache basically has a data array. It also has a tag array. Okay, and so when I'm doing a snoop, right? So when I'm paying attention to what others are doing, if someone else is doing a read of A, what I need to do is look up my tags to see, you know, do I have a copy of A? And if so, is that copy of A going to be in shared or modified state? Okay, so I have to, you know, keep looking at my tags, and this this introduces, you know, heavy contention for cache tags. Okay, so sometimes it makes sense to duplicate the tags so that uh, it's it's easier for me to look up the tags and yet not starve requests that are coming from the processor. Okay, and so you know, just keep in mind that the tags are heavily burdened when you have um, a snooping based protocol because you're constantly looking at your tags to see if you have a copy of data and if you need to provide a response. Okay, I should also mention that you know we've introduced three different states for every cache block modified, shared and inclusive which is why this is also called the MSI protocol. Okay, then I'd also said that you know there are two conditions that you have to enforce to confirm that you have a valid and, and correctly working cache coherence protocol, which is you know write propagation and write serialization. Okay, so let's see if these two conditions are fulfilled by this protocol that I just described. Okay, so write propagation just says that when I do a write, everyone sees it. Okay, and that's certainly the case over here, right? So when I do a write. I have to make sure that I first um, that I first have the block in modified state. Okay, and so I do a broadcast. Everyone knows that I'm doing a write, and then when someone does a subsequent read, it is my responsibility for providing the latest copy of data. Okay, so uh, you know this certainly ensures that the write that I'm performing will eventually get propagated to everyone else. Okay, and if no one else reads it, then at some point the block will be evicted out of cache, and when that eviction happens, that's when I update main memory. Okay, so then again, if someone else is going to read the value, the, they will get the correct uh, value sitting in main memory. Then let's look at the other condition, write serialization. Okay, so let's assume that this one wants to do a write of A, and let's say it's trying to write the value 5 into A. There's another processor here that's also trying to do a write of A at the same time, and it wants to do a write of 7. Okay, so now, you know, these two writes are both going to be, let's say, cache misses and both of these writes want to go out on this bus okay at a time the bus can only carry one request okay so there is a centralized arbiter that grants the bus to one of these agents in every single cycle okay and it, it may use you know either a round robin policy or some kind of fairness mechanism but eventually it says that you know this processor has now been granted permissions to use the bus so at this point this processor will place a request saying i'm trying to do a write of A, everyone else invalidate your copy. So it gets a copy of the block in modified states and puts in a 5 over there. Okay, and then in the next cycle, this processor gets access to the bus. So the arbiter says that now you can place your request in the bus and it says, I want to do a write of A. Everyone sees it. This block gets shipped across over here. It's currently sitting with 5, but then later it'll get modified to 7. Okay, and now when someone else tries to do a read of A, this latest copy 7 gets shipped over here, right? So it gets the value 7. Okay, so we are doing write serialization because the bus is your serialization point. Based on how the bus is arbitrated, a given processor P1 first receives it, and then P4 receives it, and everyone is going to see writes in exactly the same order, right? And anyone that tries to do a write later is going to see the write that was performed by the second processor. Okay, so everyone is going to see the value of 7 moving forward. Okay, so this does guarantee that our design uh, fulfills the right serialization condition. So we have implemented a correct cache coherence protocol. Okay, so you know before I finish, there's another detailed example that I've worked out over here, and you know you can see uh, the states of the block in every single cache as I perform every single operation. I won't walk through this now. Uh, you can spend some time just just confirming that. Uh, these values agree with your understanding of how um, a block is cached in different processes and what state it should have. Okay, and note that you know I'm also working with multiple blocks over here. I'm working with, 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 with blocks X and Y. 
and I'm assuming that you know both can't coexist in the cache at, 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 at any given point of time. So if I bring in Y into process array, I'm going to evict X. Okay, so that's also what I'm assuming over here. So I'm also showing what happens when a block gets evicted. And if the block is in modified state when it's evicted, it has to update the contents of, uh, of main memory. Uh, if the block is in shared state, then that eviction can be silent. That is, I don't have to do anything else when I'm evicting this, this block. Okay, And this detailed table kind of shows you uh, the action required by everybody. So it shows you know, different kinds of requests. Who is providing the request? Is it a request being placed you know, by a processor? Or is this a request that you are seeing on the bus from a different processor? And then based on your own cache block state, you know, what action would you have to do? Okay, so you know you can walk through this table as well to confirm that it agrees with what I just explained in my examples. So in the next set of videos, I'll look at a directory-based protocol.